lighting. We're a little small this morning, <laughs> guys, but that's okay. That's okay. We're here to uh, worship the Lord and sing praise to him. I think Psalm 100 is so appropriate. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. So let's stand and sing to him and to one another, too, as we encourage one another in song this morning. Praise the Lord. 
Good morning. As we gather on this morning to worship the Lord, our scripture reading comes from Psalm 73, where we read, Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, 
The nearness of God is my God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. Amen. This is a new song, but it's taken right from Psalm 130. So if you have a chance to read that later today, you'll see we are singing God's word. If you want to listen for the first verse, then the rest is pretty much the same. Then join us, join in with us after that. Out of the depths I cry to you. In darkest places I will call. Incline your ear to me anew. And hear my cry for mercy, Lord. Were you to count my sinful ways, how could I come before your throne? Yet full forgiveness meets my gaze. I stand redeemed by grace alone. I will wait for you. I will wait for you. together, please. Oh, God. 
Jesus come There will be justice All will be new Your name forever Faithful and true Jesus is coming soon Like a bride waiting for a groom We'll be a church ready for you every heart longing for our king we sing even so come lord jesus come even so come lord jesus come so we We wait your coming soon. So we wait, we wait for you. God, we wait your coming soon. Like a bride waiting for a groom, we'll be a church ready for you every heart longing for our king we sing like a bride waiting for her groom we'll be a church ready for you every heart longing for our king we sing even so come lord jesus come Let's open in prayer together this morning. Our Father in heaven, we come to you this morning giving you all the praise, the recognition of who you are. We recognize this morning your power. We give you thanks for your promises on which we can depend. Lord, we ask this morning that you would go before us, that you would guide us in our worship service. We ask that everything that we're about would be the, the greatest desire of our hearts would be to bring you honor and glory. We ask this morning, Lord, for churches all across our country and our world. Lord, Bible-believing churches who are in very different spots this morning than normal. Some that may not be able to meet in person yet. Others that are, are struggling, that are trying to navigate these difficult times. Lord, we ask for those congregations that you would guide them that you would help them through the process, that you would bring them um, the unity that's needed. Lord, we ask that you would strengthen your church through this time, that you would refine it. We ask, Lord, that as we gather this morning, that we would be mindful that our, though our world is crazy, um, Lord, we look around and we see the, the madness and, and the destruction and everything going on around us, yet we look to you and we know the one who has the answers the one who can bring peace and reconciliation, and that ultimately can only come through Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you this morning for him, for our great Savior, the one who came to die for us, to reconcile us all to you. Lord, we ask that this morning that you would remind us of who you are, that we would remain mindful that you are everything that we need. You are the, the strength that we lack. You're the wisdom that we lack. You're the power that we lack. You're the healing that we lack. Lord, in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, we ask that you would watch over our congregation, our community, that you would keep us safe, and Lord, that you would use this situation on our local scale and on our a larger, even global scale, ultimately to accomplish your purposes, that you would be glorified and magnified, and that we would see tremendous things come out of this. We pray, Lord, that there would be revival. 
We ask that we would see people coming to know the Savior that wouldn't otherwise. We ask that you would guide us in the remainder of our worship service this morning and that you would um, bless our children as they get into your word as well. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, if you've got your Bible this morning, um, we're going to touch on several passages, but the primary one is around 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So go ahead and grab your Bible and flip over to 1 Thessalonians 5. We're going to continue with our special series, uh, The Bible and End Times Prophecy. This is our second installment, and today the subject matter we're going to be looking at is the rapture. So maybe something that's been on our minds a little more than usual these last few months. Um, As we do so, we'll take a moment for prayer, uh, for silent prayer as well, where we can uh, come before the Lord and we can take care of anything that we need to take care of as far as sin we know is that thing which can hinder our fellowship with the Lord. Um, But the promise we have in Scripture from 1 John 1, 9 is, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we want to do that, have that close fellowship restored, and uh, then we'll get into Scripture together. So let's begin with prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for who you are, for your character, for the fact that you are constantly the God who forgives and restores and cleanses and edifies, teaches. Lord, you have given us everything we need for this life in this world, for the time that we have. You've given us your word. You've given us your truth, your promises. We ask this morning, Lord, that you would teach us from your scriptures, that you would show us more of who you are and the plan you have for human history, where we fit into that. Lord, and that it would um, embolden us, strengthen us, guide us, direct us, and maybe challenge us as well. We ask, Lord, your blessing on this time we have spending uh, to spend in your word. We ask that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts that would desire to understand. Lord, we ask that it wouldn't be something where your your words are something trivial to us and just go in one ear and out the other, but we would really desire to be fed of the solid meat of your word, which comes only through getting into it and digging in and and studying. We ask that you would bless this time we have and uh, that you would use it uh, for our benefit and for your glory, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I wanted to begin with something you, you may have seen this morning, or this past week or a couple weeks, it was a, a meme that went around. Uh, me looking outside to see what chapter of Revelation we're doing today. <laughs> and I think that that uh, sums up a common sentiment. Um, but we'll, what we're going to look at this morning is a continuation of where we were two weeks ago. And we, we tried to begin setting the framework of, essentially, we looked at Matthew chapter 24, we looked at um, Daniel chapter 9, and we began trying to build a framework for end times prophecy and trying to, to give us our roadmap of sort of how God has laid it out for us and where we fit into that. And of course, this morning we're going to be focusing on what's next. Among other things, this morning we're going to talk about seven reasons. I think we've got them up here. Seven reasons why the rapture is the next event of Bible prophecy, and also why it occurs before the seven-year tribulation. Now, that's certainly not a a given. It is a a very controversial subject, one of the most controversial that I've run across, certainly in in Bible college and seminary. That's uh, one that seminary students just love to latch onto and and to run with and to debate. Um, But we'll we'll try to take a look at the the biblical passages involved and and how we, we get to this conclusion. Again, just by way of review, kind of what we talked about the last several weeks, last Sunday we had a a special message for for Father's Day, but essentially the two weeks before that, we talked about what's Satan's agenda. Um, And he wants to control this world. He wants to be the one sitting on the throne instead of Jesus Christ. And he has been given a lot of latitude by God to be the lowercase g, God of this world, the ruler of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the one who is the the liar from the beginning, uh, the one who seeks to destroy, 
and to harm, but ultimately to get people into subjection to him and his ways and, and to see a world that's full of anarchy and um, essentially just having everybody buying into lies. He seeks to exalt himself. He seeks to subjugate everyone. And he uses a variety of means to do this, among them coercion and fear and stirring up uh, animosity and chaos of all different types. We discussed last time that what is going on around us is simply a manifestation in our time and space realm of what's going on in the spiritual realm of spiritual warfare. There is a battle raging between God and his forces, his angels, and Satan and his forces, the the fallen angels. So what we also mentioned previously is that Satan is described in Ephesians chapter 6 as being one who launches offensive weapons. We're implored to take up the shield shield of faith by which we can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And we look to identify some of what those flaming arrows look like in our everyday lives, where we uh, looked at Galatians chapter 5, 19 through 20. And some of those are uh, stirring up enmity and strife and disputes and dissensions. And a lot of times we think of those in just person-to-person terms among uh, church and community and all that, but um, certainly those are big-scale items that Satan tries to use wherever he can, big, big picture or individual level. So we, we said last time that Satan is the one who is trying to stir things up. He's trying to pit people against each other. He's trying to get people to take sides and become angry. And I don't think we've ever seen that in our current weeks, have we? <laughs> My goodness. I think that we see that more than ever. I want to stop, though, with a, a little bit of a word of encouragement um, for, for all of us as a congregation. And, and I, I know that we're, we're missing many this morning because of vacations and particularly because of cherry season. Um, and we need to remember those in prayer as well, that the Lord would strengthen them and, and uh, sustain them during this time. But I wanted to stop and say uh, for our local congregation, that um, to all of us, brothers and sisters, that these are very trying times. And the possibility is ever before us that we could uh, come at each other and, and start to tear into each other and, and to um, really do a lot of destruction. And that's what Satan wants. Um, but I want to say that just a big thank you to all of you. Um, you know, that, that has not been the case, that we have been able to navigate these difficult weeks with grace and with brotherly love and understanding and um, for the maturity that that demonstrates and the testimony and example that that manifests for those on the outside looking in, observing how we act toward one another. We established two weeks ago in our part one the biblical framework for end times prophecy. We looked at passages in Matthew chapter 24, Daniel chapter 9, and uh, Jeremiah chapter 25 particularly. And what we saw in doing that is that there was a, uh, a decree from Artaxerxes to rebuild the temple. And that's an important starting point when you get to the prophecy of Daniel, chapter 9. I'm going to put this graphic back up here. Here's our, here's our, our math that we have to kind of sort through. So if you're a math person, you probably love this. If you're like me, you kind of struggle with the numbers, but it is really important. So there was this decree of Artaxerxes to rebuild the temple in 445 B.C., And what that began is a clock of 490 years of the prophecy given to Daniel. And and we we find that proclamation in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. And, you know, Nehemiah is there serving. He comes before the king. He makes his petition, and the decree is granted. So there's 483 years in total that are mentioned. They're broken down into 49 years, which would be required here. Uh, 49, whoop, that wasn't the button. 49 years to time it took to rebuild Jerusalem. The exiles come back out of captivity in Babylon, and they begin that process. It takes 49 years. So therein we have one week of seven years. 
Then there's listed 62 weeks, or 434 years. That being the time necessary to, to rebuild the temple until there would be a very important event in the, around the year 32 AD, and that's when the Messiah would be cut off. He would be crucified on a Roman cross. From there, we are, the, the prophet Daniel is given this one more week, and everything about this week is different than the other weeks. It is hanging out there. It's all future terms. Uh, it speaks of this time that's very different when our Lord Jesus refers back to it. There's been some that have said, well, how do we know that the seventh week wasn't right after the 69 weeks? When you, seven, it was right here. It just came right after it. Well, because none of the, none of the numbers work. None of the chronology works. Nothing works. Um, so and here's our Lord Jesus, about right here, referring to that 70th week of Daniel as if it hasn't happened yet. And so it would be in the process of happening if, you know, if it was subsequent. But yet there's this gap of time in which we find ourselves living, which is um, our present day, the age of the church. The temple has been destroyed, and uh, sacrifices at that point ceased. But this 70th week points ahead to a time when sacrifices are happening. So what we know is that the temple has to be rebuilt. The Levitical priests will begin sacrifices. It will start over again, and this will set the stage for the events that will take place in this seventh week, or the, the 70th week of Daniel is how it's often referred. It's made up of seven years. Uh, it can be split in half, as it's oftentimes done, into months or days. And uh, you find these same numbers that match, again, in the book of Revelation as well. Okay, so this, this sets our, pi- our framework of biblical prophecy. So here we are. Here's the 70th week of Daniel, also known as the tribulation. So keep that term in mind. The tribulation, we're going to be talking about that. What about the rapture? You'll hear a lot of people talk about the rapture as well. So we're going to put that on our next graphic here, little arrow. Um, so right... The, at the beginning time frame of the seven, week, seven years of the uh, tribulation period begins with the rapture. So that would be the next event in Bible prophecy. We believe it occurs before the seven-year tribulation, and this morning we're going to talk about why we believe that and what that has by way of implications. So the, the first thing we want to mention this morning is... Um, again, these seven reasons why the rapture is the next event of Bible prophecy and occurs before the seven-year tribulation. So we're going to start putting these up here. Number one, the chronology. of If you've got your Bible open to 1 Thessalonians, the end of chapter 4 going into chapter 5, the end of chapter 4 speaks of the rapture, and then chapter 5 switches gears to talk about the day of the Lord. So the chronology, one happens before the other, and it's the rapture that happens before the day of the Lord. So that gives us the idea that one comes before the other, and then we have to start piecing things together and and fitting them together and figuring out how the Lord has designed them in relation to that seven-year tribulation period that we have, again, right here. So how does the rapture fit together with, uh, if we understand the day of the Lord and Christ's return? And we have the, the rapture preceding it, and then seven years in between. How do we get there? Well, um, again, here's, here's seven ways that we get there. So first is the chronology, that the rapture comes first. The rapture doesn't come after the day of the Lord. It doesn't come during the day of the Lord. It comes before it. The second one we have is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, and chapter 5, verse 9 where we read that believers are not subject to the wrath to come. There's another passage in Revelation chapter 3 that mentions uh, something very similar. So what, it helps if we can kind of break this down. To, for, for us as believers to not be subject to the wrath to come, well, what's that a reference to? Well, the tribulation period is throughout the Bible referred to as the time of God's wrath 
or God's judgment and a time associated with destruction. So to, in the context of a book like 1 Thessalonians that talks about uh, the events of biblical prophecy, to speak quite clearly that we will not be subject to that wrath gives us a lot to go off of. We can also look at the fact that the tribulation is the time where God will judge the wicked, not the righteous. So just on a theological basis, it would make sense for us to not need to be present, um, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses uh, 6 through 12, it would make sense for us to not be present because it's not part of what God is in the process of doing. Also, we mentioned two weeks ago that the tribulation is the time also called Jacob's trouble, where the other purpose, in addition to God um, bringing the judgment that is due the wicked, he is also going to be judging and refining the unbelieving nation of Israel in order to bring them to salvation. It's going to be a difficult time on the earth for the Jewish people, but God is going to be using it to apply the pressure, and out of that, um, eventually all Israel will be saved. Okay, so we have, first is chronology. The second is that we're told that we are not subject to the wrath to come, and we have good reason to take that to apply to the tribulation period. And I should just stop there and say that when you look at the book of Revelation, the majority of the book of Revelation deals with this time we call the tribulation, this seven-year chunk of time when things just go completely bonkers and um, destructive and wrath poured out on the earth by the Lord. And you read Revelation and you go, whoa, this is, this is serious stuff. So this is the time that we're talking about of wrath. Number three, we have biblical examples, two of them, that highlight two individuals, Noah and Lot, which illustrate how God did rescue them and will rescue the righteous from impending destruction. 1 Peter 3 verse 20 is one reference to Noah, um, but it's uh, elaborated on by the Apostle Peter in 2 Peter chapter 2 verses 5 through 9. There, there's highlighted this idea that God um, would bring a flood on the earth. Back in Genesis chapter 7, 8, you, you recall the story of Noah and how God, because of the great wickedness on the earth, he had to destroy the earth and all of its inhabitants by water. And in 2 Peter, this is picked up by the Apostle Peter, and he says just in the same way that God rescued Noah, I'm going to flip over there, just in the same way that God rescued Noah, he is able to do the same thing again. Uh, I should read it word for word. Um, it says, But God preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, his family members, when he brought a great flood upon the world, upon the world of the ungodly. Um, so, this now this has been debated by those that say, well, was it God? Um, you know, he he had him on an ark. Was it him preserving Noah through the flood, or was it him rescuing him up out of the flood before bringing the impending judgment? Well. The, the very next verses give us the answer of what is being referred to because then God goes on to, through the Apostle Peter, give us the example of Lot. It says in verse 6, And if he, God, condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter, and if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard, that righteous man, while living among them, Lot, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation, from trials, um, from the things to come, and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. So it's saying um, we all, I think, hopefully learned as kids the story of Abraham and his nephew Lot, and Lot and his family lived in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. There was great wickedness in the cities. God was going to bring destruction on the cities. But first, what he did is he removed Lot and his family, the only righteous people in that city, before raining down the destructive um, burning sulfur that, that 
uh, destroyed the city. So I think that clarifies what the Noah example is speaking of. That before the, the judgment came, God provided the rescue up out of there, got both Noah and his family and Lot and his family out of harm's way before the destruction was brought. So those biblical examples from Second Peter, which go on to speak of biblical prophecy in the subsequent chapter, that's chapter 2, and then chapter 3 is all about biblical prophecy, that that's also an, a third reason why we believe what we believe about the rapture and how it's going to happen before the seven-year tribulation and how that makes it the next item on the prophetic calendar. Number four, the rapture is not mentioned in the book of Revelation, which primarily deals with the seven-year uh, tribulation. Now, that's an argument from silence, which people will generally say is not the strongest, granted. Um, but why is it not mentioned? Because there are plenty of people that are constantly looking to find the rapture in the book of Revelation. Well, I see it here. I see it in chapter 3. I see it in chapter 5. I see it in chapter 6, here, there, or at the end of the book of Revelation, chapter 19. It's just not there. The rapture passages that we have um, really don't come from, from uh, the book of Revelation. So that begs the question, well, where is it? And the presumption is that it's not mentioned because it's already happened. Let's keep going. It, reason number five. The church is not mentioned in the book of Revelation until chapter 19. Now, this is important as well. Where is the church? So, the judgment of God deals with the seven-year time period of God pouring out his judgment on the earth, the, the seal judgments, the bowl judgments, the, you know, all the, the, uh, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, all this type of thing, right? Well, where's the church? There are saints described, so there are people who have come to faith during that seven-year time period, but there's not the church. Then we do find the church, and it occurs in Revelation chapter 19 toward the end of the book, and the church is in heaven at that point, preparing, getting ready for, getting adorned in wedding clothing for the marriage of the Lamb. So this would, again, be an argument um, a, a little bit stronger. It's not from silence per se, but it, it gives us a location for the church during this seven-year tribulation. It speaks of the marriage of the Lamb and his bride. And I'd say of all the biblical imagery of Christ and his church, one of the most neglected through time has been the bride and bridegroom imagery. And what I love about the songs like we sang this morning and other songs that have been written in the last couple decades and um, you know, some of the, the, the different writings that have come out um, by popular authors is that people are starting to look to these imagery in Scripture of of. Christ as the groom and the church as the bride, and to develop that into, um, you know, to bring it to light, to, to bring it to people's attention, and that's so needed, and I'm so glad that that's happening, because it's very, very beautiful, and it's important in, the, in understanding God's plan for the future. So we have the church in heaven in Revelation 19, then what happens is Christ um, goes out on a white horse along with those who have just been described, the church following him on white horses as he goes out to battle, where it says the kings of the earth and their armies will make war against him. So we understand this as Christ's return to the earth, his second coming, the day of the Lord begins here. Number six, we have the restrainer. In 2 Thessalonians 6, the restrainer, we're told, must be taken out of the way in order for the Antichrist to be revealed. Now, who or what is the restrainer? Well, if you look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 6 and 7, um, most versions have this rendered well. Um, I'm just going to turn there quick. It says, And you know, this is the Thessalonians, based on how the Apostle Paul has been teaching them about Bible prophecy, particularly in uh, the book of First Thessalonians, and you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. This is um, the Antichrist. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. 
So who is this he that is being spoken to, spoken of? Well, there's really only a few options. Um, one, I, I suppose, could be the archangel Michael, who we know is um, assigned to the nation of Israel and does battle in the spiritual realm, but that, that just doesn't get mentioned anywhere in the context in any way that would make sense. The, the most logical inference, the most logical reference to this article, which is a single, singular masculine article in the Greek, he who now restrains would be the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, um, spirit, pneuma, is a neuter word in the Greek, but it takes the masculine article, the spirit, who is he. So it just makes sense that in order for the restrainer to be taken out of the way, that that would be the Holy Spirit, because where the spirit goes, the church goes, and where the church goes, the spirit goes, right? Because we're all indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So if God takes his church out of the way, he takes the Holy Spirit out of the way, and then that force which is restraining the world's evil provides a check against evil in this world, just completely running rampant, lawlessness going wild, evil going crazy in the world is removed, the Antichrist gets revealed. That just makes a ton of sense, both in the Greek and with theology, theologically. Number seven, Jesus Christ ascended into the clouds and will return in the same way he left. Now, this is significant because um, we have essentially two events in biblical prophecy that occur, we believe, on either side of that seven-year tribulation. At the beginning of the seven-year tribulation, we meet Jesus in the clouds. At the end of the seven-year tribulation, he comes and touches down on the earth, right? His feet touch down on the Mount of Olives, splits in two, uh, you know, you look at, uh, uh, was it uh, Joel, I think? It talks about the, his feet touch down and the earth just sort of like melts, like butter underneath his feet. So you, it's that an idea of the, the power present in Jesus Christ when he returns to the earth. But when, if you look at Luke chapter 24, the very end of the book of Luke, you see Jesus and his disciples and um, they're making their way. We put this up here two weeks ago. They're making their way along the road, past Bethphage, they're heading toward Bethany, and all of a sudden Jesus goes up into the clouds. He is met by angels and just disappears into the clouds. And then in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, where we find the disciples being told that in the same way in which he left, he will also return. So if he, if he left by going into the clouds, he'll return by coming back out of the clouds. And we're also told that that is the same way the, the rapture will happen. We will meet Jesus in the clouds. So by way of this statement, we can expect the rapture to occur in the same way Jesus left this earth, the same way that he will return for his church. So again, I don't know that that completely helps us with the chronology, um, but when we put it together with everything else, I think that it does present a seven reasons. So this for me, uh, I'm just kind of giving you my own study on this. You'll find other arguments out there, both for and against the nature of the rapture, when the rapture happens. Um, as I've wrestled with the scriptures, I've read the different positions, a lot of different positions on this, and the arguments made, these, to me, stand out as the seven strongest reasons for understanding the rapture to happen before the seven-year tribulation. Okay, so let's keep going with this by asking a few questions. And those questions we can ask go like this. Um, first of all, what's the point of the rapture? Well, I think that to answer that question, it first would help if we understand the nature of the church. The church is not spoken of in the Old Testament. The Old Testament, if you look at prophecy, if you look at God's dealings with the nation of Israel, um, it's all about Israel. It's, it's Israel-centric. So the church in the Old Testament is what the New Testament would call a mystery, and it does. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32, the mystery of Christ and his bride, the church. I, I love this imagery. Um, that were given in, in Ephesians 5 and in, again in Revelation 19. 
So if, if we understand that there's rela- this mystery, a mystery in, in our common lingo is something that can never be known. A mystery in biblical terms, the Greek word mysterion, is something that formerly wasn't understood, but it's understood now. So it was not known in the Old Testament, but it is made quite clear to us now. The church was promised by Jesus Christ. If you look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, um, he starts speaking of the church, which was something that hadn't existed before, and Jesus promises that he is going to build his church. He promises that the gates of hell will not prevail against it, etc., etc., etc. So there is, he's saying there's something coming. Well, when does the church come into existence? Glad you asked. Um, on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 47. So the Holy Spirit comes into the world at the day of Pentecost. Uh, this feast, this observance... Year after year, year after year, year after year, by Old Testament saints, by Jewish people, they would, they would mark off that feast of weeks, counting down toward Pentecost. And it prefigured this which would happen on the day of Pentecost. So the, again, just the, the three spring feasts of Israel prefigured Christ's first coming and the entrance of the Holy Spirit, who he would promise at the end of the Gospels, I'm, I'm going to give you a helper to come and to guide you and to indwell and, and to assist you, to uh, come alongside you. The three fall feasts of Israel prefigure his second coming. Um, so uh, we you know, just keep those in mind that there's, this is the third of the three spring feasts, and it was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. Anyways, I digress. The point of the rapture then is to unite the bride, which is the church, with the groom, which is Christ. You ever think of the rapture in those terms? I hadn't really either, but uh, it is. It is what it's about. So when you think of a wedding, when was the last time you went to a wedding, right? Maybe you went to some that were really crummy and you just wanted to get out of there. Maybe you went to some where it was a, a joyous occasion and you were just glad. I mean, you were celebrating for the bride and groom and... Um, this was their big day, and you know, maybe you're in the wedding, maybe you get to be part of the wedding party. A wedding is a wonderful occasion. And if, it, if it is that way in the earthly realm for us as men and women, imagine what it's going to be like in God's realm when we're dealing with Christ and the church. It will be a joyous wedding ceremony that will take place in heaven, and I believe that it will happen while at the same time God judges this earth. He's going to judge the Hebrew nation with their unbelief, by and large, as a nation. He's also going to judge the rebellious and the wicked enemies of his who are left on the earth. So God's word stipulates that we, the bride of Christ, will not be subject to the suffering that will be taking place on the earth. It just doesn't fit with the uh, plan of, of God for his church and what he has promised by way of prophecy. Okay, so next question is, what is the nature of the rapture? Well, the word for rapture is the Greek word harpazo. And it's a word that means to do this. To grab. It means to grab, to seize. And when it speaks of the rapture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, its location is described as in the clouds, and we are grabbed from the earth Um, and placed in the clouds. So a few things about the nature of the rapture. I believe that there's not reason to not believe, or I guess we could say there's good reason to believe that it will be visible, a visible event to all. It wasn't hidden from Jesus' disciples when he went up into the clouds. They could watch him going into the clouds. So if that's the pattern, that will be the pattern for us as well. We also read that the dead in Christ will rise first. So we have an order of events of who goes how into meet Christ in the clouds, and those who have already died in Christ get to go first. There's, um, I would say, a lot of confusion about passages in the New Testament which talk about the thief in the night. As far as I'm concerned, all of those are references to Christ's second coming, and that there's just a lot of confusion that comes in by that way. Um, So what comes out of this confusion 
has led many to this idea, and it's become you know, popularized with the, the Left Behind series, which I really enjoyed reading, um, of a, a secret rapture, right? So it just happens so quick and so suddenly that it's completely invisible, and all you're left with is a pile of clothes. Maybe, but that doesn't to me seem to fit with the visible idea of watching Christ go into the clouds and that we as believers will follow that same pattern and that it will be observable to everyone around. So I, I don't believe that there's sufficient reason for it to be secret or invisible. Um, how about the timing of the rapture, which is debated? Um, again, I believe that our understanding of the rapture relies on putting together many passages. There's not just one passage that we can look at, I mean, that'd be nice, where it would say, you know, this is how it happens, point blank. Um, the closest we have, the most explicit passage is 1 Thessalonians 4.17. And I believe that once we put together the passages um, along that passage, 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 17, along with what comes after it, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11, which deals with the day of the Lord. We see that the rapture comes before, chronologically, the day of the Lord and Christ's second coming. However, what's not clear is, okay, so one comes before the other, but how far does one come before the other? Are they right before each other? Are they interconnected? Is there a gap of time? And that's really where the debate lies. So what are the different positions that Christians hold? And you're going to hear these out there in terms of the rapture taking place in relation to the tribulation. Well, you've got the, the pre-tribulation rapture, which is what we, we hold to. Um, we hold to a pre-millennial view of end times prophecy, of eschatology, that, that essentially um, the... The events spoken of in terms of the rapture and uh, the tribulation and the second coming of Christ occur before the millennium. We hold a pre-millennial view. There's also um, post-millennialism and there's amillennialism. You can get into a whole uh, debate within this. But for the sake of what we're talking about today, because we take our Bible literally, we're going to assume a pre-millennial eschatology. And within that, there's different views. There's a pre-tribulation rapture, there's a post-tribulation rapture, there's a mid-tribulation rapture, and there's just sort of this pre-wrath rapture that could happen anywhere in there before it starts to get too bad. I, I know people that hold all these positions, and uh, really wonderful people that have studied their Bibles. When Olivier Melnick was here from Chosen People Ministries, I remember him saying that um, he is a, a pre-millennial guy in terms of his understanding of end times prophecy, and he holds to a pre-tribulation rapture. He just says, I'm, I'm just pre-everything. I don't even eat post-cereal. Um, that's, that's one way of looking at it. So th that is where we're looking at, um, as far as our understanding of Scripture, it would be a pre-tribulation rapture. Um, there are, again, there are arguments that can be made well for, for the other positions. Um, however, based on just my own wrestling and studies, I, I think that there, there are at least seven reasons, good reasons, probably more, um, to believe that the rapture will occur before the tribulation. Okay, another question. Why do some believers believe that it occurs, the rapture occurs at the same time as Christ's second coming? That, that there, it's just all sort of one event. I believe that it comes from confusion, that it comes from confusion in terms of Scripture, which is actually quite clear, that the rapture occurs in the clouds while the second coming of Christ comes again to the earth. Um, could they happen together? Sure, they could. I don't know what that would look like. I had a professor in Bible college that called, they called it um, going up and coming right back down. Um, he, he kind of teased another professor about his view in that way because he held to a, a post-tribulation view. Um, it could happen. I mean, God can do it however he wants. But um, I think that when we look at the scripture, that that kind of a view essentially comes about because of confusion between the rapture and Christ's second coming and the day of the Lord. And it just all starts to get wrapped together, which has occurred. Many, many Bible scholars throughout church history have lumped them all together. It can be done. I just don't think that it's the best way to look at the various scriptures. Okay, the next question. This is an important one. Is the rapture scary or hopeful? 
I think any times we, we think of the future, we think of the unknown. And when we think of the unknown, we think of scary. Uh, that just is common. That's human nature. We think of, I don't know, I've, I've never um, been able to wrap my mind around that, so it seems scary. Well, maybe it would help if we were kind of reframe it a little bit and talk about it in these terms. That really what is scary is reading a book like Revelation. It's scary for those that are there in the midst of that, that are being judged. So what's scary is God's judgment that will be poured out on the earth, his wrath during the tribulation. The picture we get is the nations raging, the wickedness of the earth running rampant, that the people of the earth are just violently against God, There's rampant wickedness and immorality on the earth. There's rejection of all truth. There's willful ignorance, and that's only going to increase as we get closer to the end. Violence will increase. Hatred of the Jewish people, anti-Semitism will rise. And you know it's going to all have to be dealt with. Someone's got to deal with it, and that someone is God. God in his justice must deal with such extreme wickedness on the earth. And he's also working with his chosen people at the same time. So that is actually quite frightful. But what is hopeful is that instead of being caught in the warfare, caught up in the violence, caught up in God's judgment, we will be experiencing God's very best. That is lawlessness and rejection of the truth and human government run rampant, totalitarianism, evil begins to proliferate and spread here on the earth. Our hope doesn't lie in this earth. Our hope lies in the fact that God can either stop that evil in its tracks, as he certainly did during World War II. You had some massive evil regimes that had taken over vast swaths of land and and caused great suffering to many peoples. And God intervened to bring that to a stop. And he can do that again. He's done it time and again through history. So on the one hand, that's one option. He can do that. He can, he can stop it. He can subdue it. Or if it's his timing and his plan, he can allow that evil to proceed, to, to begin to take its course and to take over the whole earth. But I believe that it, at the time that that happens, he will spare us from the wrath to come. What that sets up for us, those who know Jesus Christ, who've put our faith in him, is a win-win. Whatever happens, God is in control. Whether we continue to live life on this earth or he removes us by way of the rapture, both ways we get his best. So I would say that the rapture is God's provision for us and it is a tremendous blessing and it is a great source of hope. So if we hold to a pre-tribulation rapture, how does that affect how we live day by day? Well, if you you read some of the the other positions that people hold theologically, their main criticism, one of their main criticisms that they will generally uh, get to sooner or later, is the claim that with the thought that we won't be going through the tribulation, that there is therefore no motivation. There is no scare tactic present that will scare us enough into motivating us as Christians to live for the Lord. Now, um, I I always struggle with that kind of an argument because um, I've run into it many times from people in different theological camps, and they generally accuse each other of the same thing. You have no motivation. You know, if you hold that view, there's no motivation to live for the Lord. And, And by and large, both sides are equally committed to living for the Lord, and that's kind of a a red herring, honestly. But God still holds us accountable, no matter what theological position we take, for how we redeem the time that he has given us on this earth. So what we believe about God and his promises and his word, which he's given us, reveals his character. And I would submit that that should only strengthen our commitment to serving him. That our desire should be that, as we read in the Great Commission, that the gospel be preached in all the world and that many will come to repentance and will come to the knowledge of the truth and experience salvation through Christ so that they too will not have to endure the tribulation 
if that's just around the corner, as you know, we see things in our world that certainly make us wonder about that. That as Bible-believing Christians, I would say that there really is no place for just sitting on our laurels, as the British like to say, and, and wasting our short time that we have been given. That we have just as much motivation to see others not experience the wrath to come as the other side would say that we should be mindful of with the perspective of that we are going to be going through the wrath to come. I, I hope that that makes sense. So with this, um, I, I ran across this quote this week, and I really liked it. I thought it was telling. For the time that we have, redeeming the time before us, this quote by Francis Chan, our greatest fear should not be failure of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter, but should not be of failing, but of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. Um, Francis Chan is, is a guy who is very committed to the Lord, to serving the Lord. This was shared uh, by a, a pastor I'm friends with over in, uh, in Grand Coulee. And I thought, you know, there's so much to that that, I mean, that's, that's like a sermon in itself, isn't it? So I won't start a new one this morning. But with that, um, there, there's a constant struggle and temptation for all of us during this time on this earth to focus at succeeding in the things that maybe when life is said and done and, and you know, we're at the end of that 70, 80, 90 years, however many the Lord gives us, we look back and we thought, I really nailed it at that. But I don't know that that was really what I should have been investing my time in. Time on this earth is short. I hope that we will look at it as an investment, that we will invest wisely, that God's priorities will be our priorities, and that what we are about during this time is the eternal, the things that will last forever, that have eternal value, that will see people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and live forever and be in the presence of the Lord forever. And that in doing so, that we will be inv invested and invigorated and hard at work during this time we have here with our time, our talents, and our treasures. That when we look back, we will say, I spent everything I had on the Lord's priorities, and now here I am carrying that on into eternity. And, and it's been said, it, it's worth saying again, that how great will that be to be in heaven and the Lord might say, well, this person is here because you gave to, you know, this missions agency. They sent missionaries there. That person heard the gospel. You know, a lot of times it's, it's connections that we may not even think of. They can be kind of second or third or fourth hand connections. Or maybe it's because, you know, you had a friend that was going through a tough time and you got to talking and they had questions about spiritual things and they opened up to you and you said, I don't have the answers. You're going through tough things, but I know the one who does. And you, you share the gospel with them and they get saved. And that is the, the catalyst for great change in their life. And they end up in heaven. Many things that we can be about have eternal consequences. Many things in this life that we can invest our time in don't. So choose wisely. If you're here this morning, um, you don't know the Savior. The message of salvation is a great one. The message is that we are all sinners, we're all equally affected by sin, we're all lost, we're all hopeless, we're all destined to spend eternity in hell because of the sin virus which infects all of us. But the good news is that God didn't want to see any of us have that happen to us. In 2 Peter it says that God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. The heart of God is that he brings judgment he brings discipline, he brings difficulty, trials upon us in order for us to come to a repentance, a change of mind, a change of heart, a recognition of the truth of the gospel, the saving message of salvation is that God sent his son Jesus Christ to the earth to die on the cross in your place and my place as our substitute so that we could have our sins forgiven, we could have eternal life, we could be completely changed and transformed and have a brand new life in a relationship with the God of the universe. And he he specifically wants all of us to be in that right relationship with him 
and to not spend eternity separated from him and subject to his judgment in hell. He wants all to be in heaven with him. So if you've never understood or responded to the message of the gospel, it's open to you this morning. You just have to receive it, that gift that's available to take of faith in Jesus Christ, the one who died for you. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you for this time that we've had spending, uh, been able to spend in your word. We ask that you would use it to teach us, give us a fuller and more complete understanding of you and of your word. Thank you for all the different ramifications of your instruction to us, including the things to come in the future. May we take heart, may we find hope, may we be strengthened by it, may we be challenged by it. We ask this morning, Lord, that you would use it to motivate us, that we would be motivated like never before to redeem the time that we have. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand with us as we close in song?
close in prayer this morning. Father, this morning we do want to bring before you those who are involved in the cherry harvest. Lord, they are putting in long days, and we ask that you would give them strength, that you would uh, show yourself to them in the midst of all that they're going through, that they may draw near to you, and that you may give them uh, refreshing, both physically and spiritually. They would know that we are praying for them. Lord, we also would pray for the cherry harvest. We ask that, Lord, you would work in a mighty way, because there are so many factors involved big picture level, intergovernmental levels. Lord, we ask that you would watch over and that you would go before and that you would do your work so that the labor that's being put in would not be in vain, but that it would um, see the, the fruit of the labor and it would, uh, it would be a great blessing. Lord, we ask that you would watch over all of us, that you would help us to navigate these difficult times, individually, as a church, as families, We ask, Lord, that you would draw us near to you and give us your perspective and give us the boldness to go out and to proclaim the truth to others, that we live in a dying world that needs truth and the message of salvation more than ever. Bless us this week and guide us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.